how do we assess a patient who comes in to get better uh, from say back pain or uh, occasional low back ache? Uh, would we, you know, we're not uh, possessed of uh, all your skills and knowledge and technology. Simple tests to assess one's functional mobility. Would a toe touch be a good one or do you think we should try something like an overhead squat or uh, again, it depends. Yeah, it, it, it really does depend, Ram. So if someone comes in your office, uh, as you know, you, you start the assessment the, the, the second you lay eyes on them and you're watching them move, you're watching them stand, you're watching them walk, you're watching them sit down in the chair. And uh, with some of those patients, um, a standardized movement assessment would be very inappropriate. Here they are, they're just struggling to get out of the chair. Um, and uh, where, where I'm situated, uh, they come to my office and then we walk down the hall to uh, an interview room and then I walk down two flights of stairs on purpose. Well, I don't take the elevator. I, I just walk with them and I let them push open the doors and they're heavy steel doors. So I'm watching how they are contracting their muscles to pre-stiffen or are they being sloppy and reaching? Uh, are they getting pain walking down the stairs? And then we finally get to the assessment room. Um, well, I, that's, I've already conducted quite a movement assessment in, in, in just watching all of those tasks. So sometimes I don't need to be any more formal than that. Um, and yet uh, I might have a high-profile athlete who they're, they're, they, they just look as though they're filled with the joys of spring. I can't get any pain out of them doing normal things, and I have to push them to a very high degree. So we would have to raise their ventilation rate. They might have to, you know, jump very high and lift heavy or <laughs> whatever it happens to be. So the assessment really is a tool um, chosen very specifically for that particular individual. You know, if it's an older person, and uh, as you know, it's a real risk factor for older people picking um, heavier things off the floor. Um, older people really lose that ability. So any kind of a toe touch for them, I, I wouldn't bother. Um, I've had, you, you, you know this fight league, the UFC? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I've had a few of the jujitsu uh, masters uh, from there, and after a while they become so uh, painful in the uh, flexion movement of their, of their discs because jujitsu is very heavy flexion. Uh, that's what they work in. Um, I, I don't even need to ask them to touch their toes. I know I'm just going to flare them up and they're going <laughs> to kick off a, a real round of, of an acute back again. So I don't know if, if that answers your question or, or you want to get a bit more specific, but you, you, you know, there are all kinds of ways to get down there. Uh, you can touch your toes. You could do a golfer's lift if you were just to pick up something very light off the floor. Then I would I would want to see that and and see their ability. Um, maybe I might want to uh, you know you look at the outfielders in cricket and they they kind of put their hands on their knees. Yeah. Do you know that sort of cricketers uh, s squat out there? Uh, I, I I might try that if that's appropriate. So I'm absolutely. Yeah, I'm not married to any kind of uh, assessment uh, program. I, I really am trying to learn as much as I can about the pathology and the pain trigger of that individual, and I'll, I'll do anything. All right. Okay. So um, the other thing uh, I had to ask you was, we see pelvic tilts in pretty much most people. Um, is this related to their back pain or their risk for getting uh, back pain if they train you know someone has an anterior pelvic tilt someone else a posterior pelvic tilt someone has neither of them would you say that having a pelvic tilt is going to be uh, you know associated with core weakness and then a liability for getting uh, low back pain would that be a, a correct assumption or inference well, we did a study. Uh, it was actually led by uh, one of my PhD students, Joan Scannell. 
Uh, and this was about 15 years ago now. She took 250 uh, people and screened the most lordotic backs. So those with anterior pelvic tilt. Or do you call that a poster? I would call that an anterior. I'm never quite sure. <laughs> and then she, she took the dozen or so flat backs with the posterior uh, pelvic tilts. And then we measured what's called elastic equilibrium. So if you could take my elbow, for example, and I could just go into weightless anti-gravity, my, my joint would seek elastic equilibrium. That's its least stressed position. So we asked the questions with, with the people who are very lordotic and have a, an extreme pelvic tilt one way or very flat-backed, is that just the way God made them? Or is, 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 is that the way their parents just designed their back to use a, a, a better, you know, a better description of it all. And so we measured were they in elastic equilibrium. Well, I thought they would be, but I was wrong. The people who had a lot of lordosis, you know, typical of, say, gymnasts and, and that type of body structure, they stood in extensor stress. But when they sat down, the stress went out of their back, which makes sense. It got a little flatter. Now you have the flat backs with the posterior pelvic tilt. When they sat down, they were in extreme flexor stress. But when they were standing, they were standing in their elastic equilibrium. So you see, the, the, it, it, it changes once again, depending on the, uh, the, the clinical presentation. So I would have to assess where elastic equilibrium is in that particular patient. And then I would decide after that if we would attempt to increase the lordosis or decrease it and take them towards elastic equilibrium. Okay. Uh, people go into uh, gyms uh, just to walk on the treadmill, do a little light jogging on the treadmill, put it on incline and then do a minute or so. Uh, is this something that's fine or do you think there is a low back price to pay for this using the treadmill I'm, as a regular basis of activity i understand yeah there's been several studies on this ram i am not a favor of treadmills at all uh treadmill gait patterning is not the similar as what would be uh, called just overground walking um, i would much prefer to see a back patient walking over ground. Um, if they are discogenic and get pain from sitting, I would ask them to carry a small backpack, maybe 10 kilos in the pack, low in their back. Um, that pulls them up uh, and, and actually takes the stress off the posterior part of the annulus. And to walk over gently rolling ground is actually therapeutic. And walk fast and swing the arms. That was another critical feature. On the treadmill, people tend not to swing the arms about the shoulders, but they were swinging them about the elbows. Well, when you swing the arms about the shoulders, they store and recover elastic energy through latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis sling muscles. Um, and and it, it's actually a much wiser way to walk uh, in, in a natural way. So, no, I'm, I'm not in favor. And if you want another opinion, I've never been to your country, but I hear it's a warmer place than our country. Yes. You've got no excuse. Get outside and walk in the sunshine. Totally. Totally. <laughs> uh, this is a very important question for me personally is if someone has a low back pain, would it manifest not because there's something wrong with the core per se or the low back itself, but because it's kind of a manifestation of something far more distal, like maybe something wrong with the foot, something wrong with the shoulder. So do you believe that these are uh, going to cause ripple effects further downstream or upstream? Uh, I believe they will, but I don't believe that if you've got back pain, uh, you don't have to address the back. Um, I, it may be triggered through uh, a mechanical disruption at a more distal joint or a, a muscle problem, but uh, I think you're going to have to look at both. Um, the hips, uh, as you know, are critically important because if the hips aren't working properly, then the, uh, the, the spine will, if the hips are stiff, the spine will have to bend. And uh, there's, here's something that you may appreciate. 
if you take a thin branch, you can bend it back and forth, and uh, it will survive a lot of cycles. But if you take a very thick branch and bend it, it breaks much sooner. And this is what happens with people's backs. So if you have a very slender individual, and I look at some of the yogis as an example, um, I don't see very many big-boned yogis. Usually they are thinner-boned. And uh, they can bend with much, much less stress, and there's not much risk to their backs. But if you take a thicker-boned uh, individual and then do some of the same repeated bends, um, if, for example, you, you can't ask a, a big, uh, you know, a, a, a lineman from American football who, who weighs 400 pounds and has a spine like this to do repeated sit-ups. They will hurt their back. And you, you could take a very thin person and uh, probably get away with that uh, uh, training program. So, uh, again, I, I don't know if this is answering your question, but, uh, I, again, the answer is it depends. But uh, there you go. If, if you're a thick-spined person, try and keep your hips mobile. 